Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's lecture in regards to the topic of global and regional economic cooperation and integration. So at this point in the course, we've gotten familiar with different dynamics of global business, the cultural impact on business and how to identify culture implications, the importance of communication among global business, as well as other macroeconomic factors that affect global business between countries. At the point two countries are ready to, or more countries are ready to start business together, there are definite uh, ways they can work together through, um, you know, uh, integration and, you know, policies that can help the two countries kind of come together to interact and conduct their business. We're going to cover some of that here in this lesson today. One thing that one, some countries do is borrow money. You know, if you know the United States, they've borrowed money um, throughout the decades for various reasons. You know, partnering with other countries on a global perspective, uh, it's part of it is, is the borrowing of currency and money uh, for various reasons. Uh, one could be a recession. <clears throat> a country could be in financial turmoil or have very large uh, economic issues in their country, such as uh, low unemployment, uh, high rising costs of living. You know, the United States was in a recession back in 2007 and 2008 after the mortgage crisis and Wall Street financial crisis. So during that time, you know, allies of certain countries look to borrow money from other allies in order to keep, you know, some type of public sector or public um, society from going to complete depression. Um, you know, we've seen this before and it's hard for countries to come out of recessions, but it's not impossible. Part of that, part of this is borrowing money from partnering uh, countries in order to make the most of a bad situation. It becomes very important, especially when countries are unable to pay their own public services you know, such as um, utilities or public safety, you know, or even their government um, services that offer, you know, um, uh, things for the citizens of the country. So at times countries borrow money from other countries just to keep the basic public services afloat until there's enough, uh, you know, money being made in, in the society and taxes can be afforded to pay those public services going forward. The next reason why some countries borrow money is for investments. A country may borrow money in order to invest in the public sector and also in infrastructure, which may be anything related to keeping society operating. This could be roads, airports, telecommunications, schools, and hospitals. At times, one country will go into another and invest into school systems or often healthcare. You know, there could be reasons why one country wants to go into another and invest in certain services because of the strength that those companies have or those types of sectors have compared to the country that uh, is looking to invest. At a time of war, at a time of war, um, allies may help each other out financially. You know, wars can uh, break out and therefore there's a lot of uh, economic factors that are impacted by war. It costs a lot of money to um, produce the uh, the materials and the needs of the war fighters and the soldiers. And so at times, countries are in economic issues whenever it comes to wartime. So allies at times help step in to you know keep the society of the of the country that's in some type of financial trouble from you know going to financial ruin, helping them keep their public sectors alive and a fund. The, the needs necessary. Now, often allies will also, um, who also believe in the side of the, the country in a war, you know, their allies are going to help them finance weapons or soldiers or, or food or things to keep uh, society going at that, at that time. And the final reason why countries borrow money is politics. Uh, politics is a definite factor when it comes to, let's talk about taxes for the most part. A country may borrow money in order to reduce tax rates, either because of political pressure from its citizens 
and businesses or to stimulate its economy. Countries have a harder time cutting government spending. People don't give up a benefit or service or, in the case of recession, may need the service such as food stamps or unemployment benefits just to survive in the society. So depending on the political dynamics going on between countries, one country may borrow money from another just to meet political uh, avenues or political goals. So a couple things we need to understand is how these uh, interactions and these exchanges take place. There's a variety of ways that um, money can be uh, distributed in exchange between two different countries. One's called a GATT or a General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which is a legal agreement between many countries whose overall purpose was to promote international trade by reducing or eliminating trade barriers such as tariffs or quotas. And this was a series of rules set in 1947 by 23 countries. This was to minimize certain uh, boundaries and certain obstacles when it came to doing trade and uh, conducting tariffs across countries. 23 countries abide by this and today you definitely hear of tariffs and trade in the United States government, especially when they're doing international business. And this all stands back from this general agreement made back in 1947. It's basically the rules and laws of how to do trade amongst these different countries. Something else is called an MFN, our most favored nation, and in international economic relations and international politics. Most favored nation is a status or level of treatment according by one state to another and international trade. So yes, there is favoritism involved in global business. Um, you know, there's definite countries that one country or another would like to do business with just because it might be easier for them. They have a stronger relationship. The tariffs and laws aren't as uh, challenging. So an MFN or most favored nation often in this between countries that do business together often or trade or international expansion. And this isn't uncommon in the United States either when one business prefers to do business with another business. It's just based on who's easiest to work with and who can get the job done faster as well. But there are implications when it comes to a most favored nation. The political implications of an MFN clause. So over time, there's been some impact to a most favored nation type, type situation. During the Clinton presidency, congressional representatives debated the merits of dropping the embargoes and quotas placed on China and Vietnam and granting them FN, MFN status or most favored nation. But there are proponents of this in granting the MFN they, and they uh, argue that the tariff reductions on Chinese and Vietnamese goods might give the American consumer access to quality products and relatively low prices and enhance a mutually beneficial trade relationship with the two rapidly developing economies. Meanwhile, opponents of it ones that argued against it, argued that granting MFN status to the two nations may be unfair given the history of human rights violations. Others thought the inflow of cheaper goods from China or Vietnam could cause Americans to lose their jobs. Both countries ended up receiving MFN status, although Vietnam status remains on a temporary conditional basis. So what this means, any time that a political um, entity or a a presidential administration wants to grant MFN status to other countries, there's definitely pros and cons to doing this. Uh, one example is during the Clinton administration, when they granted, granted MFN status to Vietnam and China, as you see, there were some people who were for it and some who were against it. The ones who were for it definitely saw the economic impact by the value of the products, um, lower prices and how it can impact and benefit the American economy, whereas opponents of it felt that it was going to be against other things outside economic value or economic uh, reasons for not doing the MFN status. It was more for hum humanitarian reasons why they didn't want to move forward with giving China or Vietnam MFN status. Um, but as it states, both countries received the MFN status, although Vietnam it's a very conditional basis, so it sounds like because of our history with Vietnam, um, it's a very temporary thing, and it's a case-by-case -case basis. So an MFN clause is not uh, necessarily uh, an everyday practice. It's, a, it's a more of a case-by-case -case situation that this is uh, enacted between two countries. 
but it does exist and something that we still see in global business today. So one thing you may have heard of uh, over time is something called the World Trade Organization or WTO. This has evolved over the last couple of decades. The organization that succeeded GATT and came to effect on January 1995. It is the only institutional body charged with facilitating free and fair trade among member nations. So this is something that's very relevant in today's global business environment. It's the only organization or institution that kind of facilitates um, free and fair trade among nations who are a member of WTO. It's used as a, neg a negotiation forum. The WTO provides a platform that allows member governments to negotiate and resolve trade issues with other members. The WTO was created through negotiation and its main focus is to provide open lines of communication concerning trade between its members. An example of this, the WTO has lowered trade barriers and increased trade among member countries. On the other hand, it has also maintained trade barriers when it comes to sense to do when it make when it makes sense to do so in a global context. Therefore, the WTO attempts to provide negotiation mediation that benefits the global economy. So they're looking at all times on both sides of a, a situation. What are the pros and cons and how can you know, the WTO is trying to find ways to benefit both countries, especially during a complex business environment today. Generally, once no negotiations are complete and an agreement is in place, the WTO then offers to interpret that agreement in the event of future dispute. All WTO agreements include a settlement process whereby the organization legally conducts neutral conflict resolution. So they're not only looking to negotiate on terms and conditions that benefit both countries today, but they're also looking for potential, if there's a fallout between countries, what type of exit do they have amongst the agreement? What's the clean breakaway between the two countries? Should there be an issue with their agreement down the road? There are a set of rules when it comes to a WTO. In general, no negotiation, mediation, or resolution would be possible without the foundational WTO agreements. These agreements set the legal ground rules for international commerce that the WTO oversees. When a member country signs an agreement, that country's government is bound to a set of constraints that it must observe when getting future trade policies. These agreements protect producers, importers, and exporters while encouraging world governments to meet specific social and environmental standards. One key topic to keep in mind this week when we talk about economic integration are the major areas of regional economic integration and cooperation. There are five levels of regional economic integration, and they include from the lowest extent of integration to the highest. It's free trade area, customs union, common market, economic union, and political union. First, a free trade area allows all members, member countries to trade freely without barriers among themselves, but then also allows each country to determine their own level of barriers against any non-members. So think of this as being a free trade area of you know uh, less boundaries, less obstacles for two countries to conduct business together. Where a customs union differs slightly in that in addition to eliminating barriers among member countries, it also determines the trade policy that all members will follow when engaging with non-member countries. Therefore, even though the barriers are taken down, there is a policy that is enacted to make sure there's free trade uh, equality and policies to abide by between not just the member countries, but with non-member countries that do business with them as well. A common market combines both of the previous levels of regional integration. So again, free trade area and customs union are a part of a common market. It also includes the removal of barriers to the movement of labor and capital among members. However, a common market is difficult to attain and can result in uneven benefits among member countries. A quote from the textbook is, an economic union goes beyond the demands of a common market by requiring member nations to harmonize their tax, monetary, and fiscal policies and to create a common currency. So as any market between two member countries or more member countries try to uh, become more solidified in their policies, it can create some uh, uh, uneven benefits among the member countries. There could be some biases and or some um, 
you know, political or economic impacts that favor one country versus the other. So it's very important for any countries going to be into business together to understand all impacts of the other countries, both political, cultural, economic, and so forth. Finally, the highest level of region, regional economic integration comes in the form of a political union. This occurs when countries have gone through all the other levels of inter regional integration and then also opt to coordinate their political systems in regards to non-member nations or non-member nation relations as well. Now let's talk about the European governance or how the governance of the European Union really it breaks down. As the United States is comprised of legislative, executive branches, and judicial branches, and other realms of government, policy, and um, you know, entities, the European governance is broken down into several major uh, areas. European Council, European Commission, European Parliament, the Council of the European Union, and Court of Justice. Let's take a look at some of these in more detail. First, let's talk about the European Council. The European Council is charged with defining the European Union's overall political direction and priorities. It is the institution of the EU that comprise, comprises the heads of state or government of the member states, along with the president of the European Council and the president of the European Commission. It was established in an informal summit in 1975. The European Council was formalized as a true institution in 2009, so it's really only been around for less than 10 years. It was entered in formally upon the entry of a Treaty of Lisbon. Its current president is Donald Tusk, who's the former prime minister of Poland. The scope of the European Council has no formal legislative power, so again, remember, European Council does not necessarily enact legislation, but it does have influence. It is, it is a strategic body that provides the Union with general political directions and priorities and acts as a collective presidency. Whereas the European Commission is an actual legislative entity, it's an institution of the European Union responsible for proposing legislation, implementing decisions, and upholding the EU treaties and managing the day-to-day -day business of the European Union. So the difference between the Council and the Commission is that the Commission truly holds the power to propose and implement legislation. The European Council is more of a uh, government body that influences and also has a lot of power to uh, strengthen the government and governance within the EU. Now let's talk about the European Parliament. The European Parliament is the directly elected parliamentary institution of the European Union. Together with the Council of the European Union, as we're about to talk about in more detail, and the European Commission, it exercises a legislative, legislative function of the EU. So while the European Commission can propose, the European Council can influence, it's truly the European Parliament that makes the execution of legislation in the, the EU governance. The parliament is compro composed of 751 members who represent the second largest democratic electorate in the world after the parliament of India and the largest transnational democratic electorate in the world. Back in 2009, it had 375 million eligible voters. It has been directly elected every five years by universal suffrage since 1979. However, voter turnout at European Parliament elections has fallen consecutively at each election since that date and has been under 50% since 1999. Voter turnout in 2014 stood at 42.54% of all European voters. Although the European Parliament has legislative power that the Council and Commission do not possess, it does not formally possess legislative initiative as most national parliaments of European Union states do. The Parliament is the first institution of the EU and shares equal legislative and budgetary powers within the Council. Next, talking about the Council of the European Union, it is referred to in the treaties and other official documents simply as the Council. So when you're reading about or listening to someone talk about EU governments, 
If they mention the Council, it's the Council of the European Union. It's the third of seven institutions of the European Union as listed in the Treaty on European Union. It is part of the essentially bicameral EU legislature and re represents the executive governments of EU member states. The Council of the European Union, along with the European Council, are the only EU institutions as discussed that are not European. European. Rather, they are forms where, respectively, ministers and heads of state government from member states may validly express and represent their own national interests. The composition of the council meets in 10 different configurations of 28 national ministers, one per state. The precise membership of these configurations varies according to the topic under consideration. For example, when discussing agricultural policy, the council was formed by the 28 national ministers whose portfolio includes the policy area. So it depends on the actual topic at hand, whether agricultural or other societal factors or issues that take place are depend on how many members of the council actually come together to speak. Now, finally, the last area of European governance we need to discuss is the Court of Justice. It is the institution of the European Union that encompasses the whole judiciary. It's seated in Kirchberg, quarter of Luxembourg, city in Luxembourg, and consists of two separate courts, the Court of Justice and the General Court. From 2005 to 2016, it's also consisted of the Civil Service Tribunal. The Court of Justice, informally known as the European Court of Justice, adheres applications from national courts for preliminary rulings, annulment, and appeals. It consists of one judge and from each EU member country, as well as 11 advocates in general. So it's a very robust judicial system in which many different types of uh, issues are discussed and um, reviewed, especially if they are in a global aspect with members from each participating country. Now let's talk about the United Nations governance and the six main bodies that comprise of the United Nations governance. First, General Assembly. This is the deliberative body of the UN and consists of all of the member countries that meet in regular sessions throughout the year. All of the members have an equal vote in the General Assembly. The next is called Security Council. This body is responsible for addressing issues related to peace and security. It has 15 members, five of which are permanent country representations, the United States, the United Kingdom, Russia, China, and France. The remaining 10 are elected by the General Assembly every two years. As you may expect, there's a great deal of political wrangling by countries to be on the Security Council, which is deemed to have significant power. All decisions by the Security Council are supposed to be binding on the rest of the member nations of the UN. The third is called Economic and Social Council, or ESO, or ECO SOC. This body is responsible for issues related to economics, human rights, and social matters. A number of smaller commissions and specialized agencies carry out this council's work. The ECO SOC works closely with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, both of which we covered in a previous lecture. The Secretariat. The Secretariat oversees the operations of the United Nations and is technically headed by the Security General. The fifth main body is called the International Court of Justice. Located in The Hague, this body hears disputes between nations and the court consists of 15 judges who are elected by the General Assembly and the Security Council. The court reviews cases concerning war crimes, genocide, ethnic cleansing, cleansing, and other major international interference that it interferes with one country doing affairs with another. Finally, the UN Trustees Council, the UN Trusteeship Council. While an official part of the UN Charter is charged with overseeing trustee territories under UN custody, this body is currently inactive today.
So that wraps up this video lecture. Thank you very much for your time and listening to this overview of different types of government or governance among the United Nations, the European Union, and how overall countries start to integrate when it comes to trade and doing business together. I hope you have a great week and I will speak with you soon.